We have um, the Member of Parliament for Ablekuma South and also Chairman of Parliament's Committee on Defence and Interior, um, Fritz Baffo. Fritz Frederick Baffo. Thanks for joining me this morning. And we also have the Country Director for Amnesty International, Lawrence Amesu, and uh, his organization, Amnesty International. They've been undertaking a number of activities here in Ghana and elsewhere in Africa. But this time, they've been focusing on torture. And apparently here in Ghana, it is the Ghana Police Service that has been named in their recent reports of torture to be the most um, corporate when it comes to perpetrating the act of torture among the citizenry of Ghana. And if the Ghana Police Service, which is supposed to be protecting the civilians, is the most corporate, that should be a serious subject for discussion. Well, we'll begin with that very subject. We'll also look at um, the ongoing economic forum, a little bit of it, but generally the issues on defense and interior and security will dominate our discussions. I have to start with you, sir. Uh, how come you put together this very report? And apparently, it seems to indict Ghana's own police service. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy that we're discussing this issue uh, this morning. As far back as uh, 1984, uh, the UN, um, following Amnesty International campaigns for us to look at torture in all over the world, put up a, a convention, Convention Against Torture. Um, uh, since then, about 155 uh, countries have uh, signed to it, um, but we continue to see torture all over the world. Amnesty International yesterday launched its Stop Torture campaign, and as part of it, we have carried out research all over the, the world, uh, selecting some countries. And uh, yesterday, we decided to highlight some of the findings that we, we, we came out with from that research. Um, so yesterday, basically, we were saying that there's torture still ongoing. We need to uh, pay attention to torture because it violates human rights. And that is particularly what Amnesty International is saying. Um, narrowing down to Ghana, um, we mentioned that, uh, yes, um, torture goes on in, in our country, although maybe not at the level where we can say that uh, it is pronounced as in countries such as Sudan, Nigeria. But definitely Ghana, um, there are some uh, torture ongoing in, in areas like in our prisons, uh, in the police service, um, in, in some of the new churches that we have. But we, we, cam we came to realize that uh, the police leads um, in, in torturing people, uh, particularly because maybe they are given the responsibility to arrest. Mm. And, and uh, at point of arrest, we realize that uh, a lot of torture goes on. Mm. Uh, now, as um, the chairman of parliament's um, committee on defense and interior, um, this doesn't come as a surprise to you, does it? No, it doesn't come as a surprise mm. to me. We have to look at, um, if we look at the Ghana Police Force, for example, the police service, as we now know it, um, the genesis of the police service, how it's formed and everything, we've come a long way. Um, years back, uh, the police were actually meant to protect the colonial um, government. And that's why we had a group, we had a particular uh, unit of policemen called the Escort Police. We call them Jintu and Buga Buga and all that. And they were also used to suppress uh, civil unrest. Um, that was the genesis of the, the Goku's Constabulary. Over the years, it became a police force, and it's become a police service. And then with the dynamic, social dynamics, things have changed. And um, uh, right now, people are more aware of their human rights. And our constitution actually says that you are not allowed to violate anybody's human rights. You are not allowed to torture. I mean, torture is against the Constitution, so it's against the laws of Ghana. Now, um, I'm glad that um, Amnesty International don't mention state-sponsored torture, which is a different thing altogether, whereby the state actually promotes uh, the torturing of its citizens. You mean deliberately? Deliberately, yes. I mean, it happens in a lot of the countries. Um, but in Ghana, it could be... Uh, um, Policemen either breaking the law yes, or, yeah, yes, or, the or not observing the code of conduct of the policemen. That can happen, okay, because um, why do you want to torture? I mean, torture is about try, say, trial by ordeal, where they, they, they try and put you through uh, an ordeal to prove you guilty 
or to find out information and that violates everybody's human rights mm. so therefore you know when it comes to that and uh, an individual policeman uh, exceeds his his mandate then that can occur and I think that that's where the occurrences of this mm. uh, happens but the police force in itself has undertaken to try and um, expunge all those kind of practices mm. they've brought in a code of conduct uh, they've got an internal um, uh, mechanism for, for, for monitoring the, the way the police, policemen, individual policemen and uh, police units behave. So, you know, these are things that I think I said there. Yes, and we've seen that uh, o o over the last couple of years, um, some internal investigations have even been conducted and some of those um, perceived corporates within the service have been punished as well. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we make sure that these um, uh, reforms that are being undertaken within the police service really get to the core of personnel who would then need to go according to the rules and regulations also to speak the quotes of the service well you see the thing about it is that as I said is a social dynamics we're trying to improve our police force to the level where they become the true protectors of our citizenry and when you protect someone you don't harm that person so we've changed the way we're training our, our police personnel. We're making them more aware of the rights of the human being, that they are protectors and not enforcers. You understand? There is an enforcement aspect. But that enforcement aspect is based on uh, constitutional uh, obligations and a code of conduct. You understand? So it's about training. It's about awareness. And right now, you'll see that the, a lot of the police officers, personnel from all ranks, are going through seminars and training programs so that we will have a top-class police force in this country. Mm. Yeah. Uh, now, this very survey that you undertook, uh, how did you um, get the responses? In fact, uh, the research was carried out in 21 countries covering about uh, 21,000 people who were asked about torture in their country. You, you were asked questions like, do um, you think torture goes on in, in your country? You say yes. Uh, do you think that it is important for you to have um, laws, domesticated laws, which will protect you when um, you are tortured? You say yes or no. Um, and questions like, which institutions do you think leads in, in torturing? And then you mention them. Um, so it's still a perception survey? Well, I, I think at that level, but uh, honestly, when we... Uh, we are human beings and we can observe um, um, uh, over the years what happens in our countries and basically that also builds on the, the, the survey we've carried out built on people's um, observations over the years mm. and, and, and the survey seem to confirm what people um, have been talking about in their respective countries. Mm. How crucial is it that perhaps the, the mandate of the service that is the police to make sure they protect the citizenry but be a friend a civil way to the public is always adhered to let me say that in Ghana particularly we are seeing a lot of professionalism in in the police service particularly at the top um, top level uh, we need to work on the other ranks um, uh, Fritz was talking about the fact that the the training is being packaged in a way that it will, it will f look at human rights as very paramount. And at that level, it is important when we're doing training for the police force or the police, we should clearly indicate and clearly explain that they are peacemakers and they have, they have to be very friendly to uh, the public. And that is where the problem is uh, among the other ranks. And it has to start from the training. And also, we don't just have to uh, bring in a anybody to the police force just because the person is looking for a job. It has to be a calling. And we have to work on that very carefully when we are uh, even going to train um, people for to enter the police force. Mm. Well, you can't always be calling people. That's the point. If you, when people <laughs> qualify, they meet certain <laughs> specs, uh, uh, specifications. Well, well he, he has made a point. But there's <laughs> also another point. If you... Um, equip the police and raise the standard of their practice it also then uh, prevents people from torturing because sometimes torture is to try and find out guilt all right to 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 find out 
um, who caused a particular infraction of the law. And so you torture the person or you, you, you put the person through um, a very de uh, um, dehumanizing uh, ordeal. Now, if we, uh, our policemen are trained in terms of forensics, mm. in terms of investigation and all that, and we have the necessary equipment, um, there will be no need, all right, if, if um, somebody is caught, um, uh, you know, abusing the law. Um, you can use uh, fingerprint technology, you mm. can use DNA, you can use... I mean, you see all these films now on television, CSI and all that. These things prevent pol policemen from just perceiving that somebody is a criminal, and so that person has got to go through a, a particular trial. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but if not by way of any scientific finding at all, yeah. um, by way of, of observation even, yeah. do we think that perhaps because of... Um, uh, our history or the historical background we're coming from, yeah. um, pre post colonial coup d'etat, revolutionary, etc. Sometimes the society and the citizenry themselves also tend to condone some of these acts in themselves. Well, I, uh, that, that is very true. I mean, the thing is also, we, apart from raising the awareness um, of the police personnel, we also have to. Um, work on the people of Ghana about their contribution uh, to human rights, um, you know, observance of uh, the fundamental human rights of, of our citizenry, you, you understand. Um, for example, um, right now, I mean, we, we have instances where uh, there, there's, uh, what do you call it, uh, mob justice, and people are, are murdered um, because they're perceived to be criminals without, without trial and you know upstanding citizens partake in it we have instances where um, someone um, uh, um, a particular a particular person loses uh, items and believes that it's somebody and then they, they actually torture the person in the mm. house by, mm. by putting his hands over a candle light or candle fire mm. or something like that mm. um, I, I mean as, as a child growing up you you see friends and uh, maybe you get thrashed um, for doing maybe something wrong, but, uh, for not doing something wrong, but they perceive that you've done it wrong. So our society has that thing about p uh, punishment. You understand that uh, criminals should be punished. Mm -hmm. There is also a new thinking that criminals should be reformed. All right. Um, there are three forms of, of um, there are three forms of um, uh, um, uh, incarceration. Um, one is punitive. You punish the person for an infraction. The second is um, the second is uh, um, protective because the person may be a danger to society and himself and the third is to reform reform the person so mm -hmm. these are things that for example uh, we're, 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 you know, we're watching a picture on, yeah. t on TV yeah. um, a suspect and a suspect yeah. is, is uh, apprehended yeah. uh, is being taken to the hospital but is tortured to to, uh, to the point where He's bleeding profusely, and the police do nothing about it. It's been filmed by the media as well. Well, we have on the line DSP Freeman Tete. He's um, he is with the uh, well, pu public affairs directorate of the Ghana Police Service, the Accra region. A uh, very good morning to you, sir. Good morning, my brother. No, good morning. Well, well it, 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 it's not as if um, perhaps um, we're criminalizing the activities of the police. But particularly when you're mentioning in a report, in a perception survey by Amnesty International, that tends to point to your organization as the lead organization in torture. Uh, that should be a worry for your organization, despite efforts you're undertaking to reform. I'm actually not... Uh, um, I've read the report fully, and I don't think at this time I'm speaking for the entire police service on, in Africa. The report did not specifically state Ghana. It talks a lot about other countries, serious human rights infractions in terms of torture in a lot of African countries. We will not attack the report because it's a scientific amnesty. It's a respectable organization. But what we can say at this time is that a lot of water passed under the bridge in the past. But thankfully, we are in a very democratic era. Ghana obviously has gone past the stage of serious human rights abuses. There are likely to be isolated cases. We have the 
1992 Constitution of this Republic, Chapter 5, that spells out extensively on issues that amount to human rights infraction. Police are taking note of that. We are also privileged as a country to have signed a lot of international instruments or uh, conventions, and we've domesticated those instruments, so they are now lost. So at a point they said there are no domestic laws, which I find is strange. Fortunately, as I indicated earlier, the report was not specific as Ghana. Well, we, we have made well, a move. We well, have gone forward to improve on our human rights record. Coming to police specific, there could be issues of abuse. They also have internal accountability system. We have uh, structures in place that deal with infractions or abuse perpetrated by policemen. Let's talk about the police intelligence and professional standards. Let's talk about only our own service infraction, the police service, now the SI service, CI service system. They are all there to make abuses among others or police misconduct serious offenses. Okay. So, for now, we have gone a long way. Mm. What, 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 we are we, talking we, about. Well, my producer tells me that we are, we are talking about democratic policing. What, 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 so issues Freeman. of torture. Freeman, my producer tells me that you, you have agreed to join us for the next 10 minutes. So just be on the line because I have. Uh, the Amnesty Country Director also in the studio. You, you, you've heard the response of um, DSP uh, Freeman Titi. Now, mm. specifically, you do acknowledge that, and uh, also um, Mr. Fraze Baff also acknowledges there are reforms ongoing. Yes. And uh, he, you both have um, outlined where we're coming from by our own historical background yeah. and what the mindsets of the people are. And it's the very people who are also recruited into the service. So it, it's more of a generic problem. Uh, how do we make sure that we have some level of synergy between what the reform, the top hierarchy of the police service wants to trickle down to the other ranks, so to speak, well, that, that and, <laughs> and, and what can be achieved in reality? Yeah. Because we're not saying that these are mass actions and, and that's the position of the police. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me say that um, the, the issue that we're talking about, uh, particularly when we're talking about the police, it is not only one factor that contributes to torture, as we have explained the historical factors, cultural issues and all that. So it is not only the police that have to be educated, mm -hmm. even the public had to be educated. In fact, a lot of uh, reforms are going on in, in, in the police service. We are very aware of it. But also, we need to educate the public. Um, uh, human rights activists, uh, including the media, need to take up this uh, education to, to the public as well. Uh, but uh, Fritz was saying that uh, he's, he's happy, or he was happy that um, we did not mention that it's a state act. But we can also say that, for example, Ghana has signed, the con signed to be part of the Convention Against Torture. But as of now, we have not signed the optional protocol on Convention Against Torture. Well, that, that, that we have not ratified. Yeah. We have not yet ratified it. And this has been on the table for quite uh, some time now. Um, uh, human rights activists uh, have been pushing for, for it to be ratified. And um, um, about two years ago, we heard or we were told that the Minister of Justice and Attorney General had uh, pushed this to, to, to Parliament. But for the past two years, we haven't uh, heard what. So it, it, it's a multi faceted uh, issue mm, that mm, we have mm. to talk about. Well, the um, Defense and Interior Committee was recently con reconstituted and has made the chairman. And we are now about to interact with all the uh, service chiefs and all the agencies under the. Uh, two ministries, the Defense and Interior Ministry, and we're also looking at the legislati uh, legislati uh, legislative backing uh, to be given to to actually um, bolster and buttress human rights, um, the observance of human rights in this country, and it's very, very important. It's very dear to me personally, and I think the members of parliament um, that I work with also believe in that. So. We'll be working on that over the next, and I hope that these, um, um, uh, the various um, bills and things that have been brought before us uh, will be debated, uh, discussed, and then uh, put before 
the parliament for ratification? Well, DSP, sometimes you have some of these incidents, they are isolated. But the point is, how do we make sure that when the police are expected to render a certain service or even protect people that they are supposed to be apprehending, whether it's a demonstration also, they are supposed to quell, etc., they don't go there and then undertake acts that are inimical to the very codes for which they are expected to protect or even implement. Yes, first of all, let me start from the curriculum of the police training institution, right from the basic to the officer level. Those things are actually emphasized. We studied issues on human rights. We studied a particular chapter 5 of the Constitution that talks about upholding the rights of the people. So right from the basic level, some kind of education is given on the seriousness of it and how certain acts will amount to abuse of serious abuse of human rights. Then on the first, they are human beings. There, there, there are, there, there's the possibility of bad math among them. Those people, no matter the kind of education you give, will not change their mindset. So what happens is that there are mechanisms in place. When it comes to the attention of the police administration or a, serious, a senior police officer, those copies found culpable are dealt with internally. When it amounts to sending them we're putting them before the law court. It's done. So just we have the statistic there to show to the public that effort has been made over the years and even currently to ensure that uh, personnel of the service are there. Well, so understandably, the so, uh, understandably so, understandably um, um, so, Mr. Freeman, but the point is, uh, do, you, do you make the effort to make sure you reprimand your personnel who perhaps perpetuate these very acts that are I on think, the blind side. No, 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 yes. Uh, no, 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 I haven't finished, I haven't finished, I haven't finished. Yes, sir, let me, let me ask a question. Do you, do, do you make sure you implement the disciplinary codes of the service or enforce them when... We have the No, sir, 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 sir. Let, let me ask a question, my friend, sir. Uh, do 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 we have the police enforcing your own disciplinary codes when your personnel they undertake some of these acts on the blind side of the public? Because all all that I know is that many of these disciplinary actions you've taken against your personnel are those that have been perhaps um, brought to the into the public domain by the media or any other person within the public sphere yes what is happening is i mean currently we have an inspection unit within the police service we have these also within the police service that conduct surprise checks at the various police stations so that when there is an infraction of the law or procedure they quickly take those people on for example they go about checking whether somebody who has been kept in cell for more than 48 hours has indeed been taken to court or granted this. So if they go through the document or the patient diary as we put it in our parlance, and they realize that something has gone amiss, what they do mm -hmm. is to bring those people to go. So that is exactly what some of the measures that we have to ensure that people's rights are not in. Mm. In the list. Well, well, I do understand it's your work to protect the image of the service, but when the reality really doesn't um, give you a very forthright image as to how you tend to enforce the disciplinary codes that necessarily pertain to cases that are not necessarily also brought before the public uh, just by the media, but also your I own think, internal I think, investigation. I think something unique happened quite recently with the Inspector General of Police and the top hierarchy of the police service coming out and telling the public that even in this, we know there are some abuses and issues of corruption in the service. We have come, we have brought this to the notice of the public. We are going to deal with them. So it's even, in an, it's even an effort by the police themselves to ensure that not things that will then the image and also constitute an abuse of authority does not continue. So it's a plus for us. And it's also a plus for the democracy of this country. Mm, well, so I, 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 genuinely, we are making commitment 
or we are committing ourselves as an institution to ensure that uh, best practices of professional standards are held within the service. There could be isolated cases. That is why we keep continue to tell the public that those things must be brought to the notice of the police administration or the, 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 the top of the leadership of the service. And in case it has, they, we don't get those information from the public, we also have our own system of checking to ensure that people within the service do not abuse their rights of the citizenry. Mm. Well, m m many critics will say DSP from Manchester is doing his work adequately. Good talk, but that's textbook talk because in reality, um, there are many activities that are undertaken by the police in communities I, I that many don't people want don't know. To be a um, sir, 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 it's not a question. I, I want to ask a studio, a, a studio guest a question. So I let me, let me, let me, just allow me a so, no, 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 I will not allow you. So let yes, me just ask the question, and then you can have a response, sir. I think that's the most civil way we can have this very discussion. Thank you. I, I know that is a very thorny issue to you as well. Now, how do we make sure that when we have these acts that are perpetrated, perhaps even if it's in small numbers, in communities which are on the blind side of the public, really, we have those community police entities enforcing the law against the personnel that are even known by the public or the very publics that we have them in those communities. Well, the thing is that apart from having a monitoring system within the police force itself, there should be a civil monitoring system. Um, one aspect of the monitoring system is what Amnesty International is doing. But within every community, within every district, within a, uh, we should be able have, to have a monitoring system. There should be a system of reportage to the civil authorities that this has occurred. And so therefore, um, we, we, should, we should be able to, to, to monitor mm. and evaluate. The job of the Defense and Interior Committee is to monitor and evaluate all the agencies. And um, we, we intend to have interaction, constant interaction with all the agencies, to look at the best ways of improving uh, those agencies in, in their contribution to Ghana's democracy and development. It's very, very important because um, as a democratic, a, a de democratic nation opens itself to the people, and the people have got to be part and parcel of the process. Without people being part and parcel, of the, they are the major stakeholders in this because it's their community. They want their communities protected. They want their communities to be safe and all that. I mean, the, the police is engaging people um, far more than before. I mean, I've been, uh, I've been in this country for a long time, and I've seen the, the, the progression. Um, in the old days, you d didn't even walk in front of a police station. You went round it. So you're saying that uh, even though there have been efforts, we should be satisfied with the effort efforts that are made? No, I'm not. Well, I'm no, not no questions could be raised. No, I mean, we, I sh I, we shouldn't be satisfied because the thing is that we should create stronger institutions for monitoring and evaluating the police from the civil side of things, you understand, so that we can ask questions. All right, we have a police council. We should have a police co complaints council that is made up of civilians where you can complain and then they will inquire. We have, um, we have the, um, uh, the SRAJ. All those things should be, should, we should allow them to engage the police and those services because those services also have a certain amount of secrecy in the operations. I mean, it's very, very important that you have your intelligence network. You can't reveal everything to the public in the interest of the public. So th those things come into play. But you should have institutions in, within the civil domain that should be able to engage and monitor and evaluate police activity. Mm. Yeah. In, addition, in addition to what the police has said, it's also important for Ghanaians to understand that they have right to complain if they feel that their rights are violated because most often when police uh, commit uh, or commit something with that we talk about like torture the public will feel that no if, if even if i go to reports nobody will take action and sometimes people do not even know that they can also report the police um dsp so inside now that you you are telling us that you're undertaking a lot of reforms which have also been corroborated by a number of um, the, the officials who really uh, work with you in this very line of the reformation process. Um, how do you make sure that in your own way you are very receptive to public criticism, public reports of such incidents, whether they are isolated or not, 
and then how do you make sure you get the trust of the public that when these reports are made you will act accordingly we've started it's a process we've started a campaign on public building confidence in the public and it's ongoing we the national campaign was launched somewhere in march the regional campaign have been launched a few regions have had their share of the campaign we are targeting the public to educate the public on police procedure and how a police officer also conduct him or herself we are also targeting the policemen to remind them beside the orientation and our educative programs in place this is a campaign that will tell the policeman in the face that and that these are the feedback we've been getting from the public and these are what the laws of the country and procedure in the services so and beside that the community policing unit is also active on the ground constantly engaging the public so there is an avenue for the public to let the police know and also for the police to know what the public feels about us uh, aside of that internal rules and regulations are strictly enforced so it's a matter of time the public will have full confidence in the police there are doubts in some instances but at the end of the day we encourage the public not to sleep on their right mm. we have constantly remind the public of our internal structures in place for them to report police misconduct the first one is peeps you can even petition right to the police council those are avenues and aside of that our peace or the police intelligence and professional standards is active on the ground constant monitoring and then the police inspection unit is also there and quite recently the inspector general of police made it known to the public that indeed the ghana police service has accepted the need for a public institution or an independent public uh, institution to deal with issues of police misconduct. Well, yes, and this one, the police has sent, has sent a concept paper <laughs> on it. So wholeheartedly, we have accepted the decision that, or the proposal that, indeed, the police should be insulated from conducting investigation into their own affairs. So it's a step forward in order to, for the public to have trust in the police. Mm. And let me assure you that whatever comes issues of misconduct that comes onto the table of the police administration is dealt with that is why i kept on emphasizing on figures we have figures to prove that this number of policemen has been dismissed over the years for act of abuse or of office or any form of misconduct that they might have perpetrated if this, they could be dismissed they could even be referred to the court for prosecution so the, the figures are there well, we, 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 do, we, do, we do understand, we do understand that you have your own codes and the way you go about it. But if a public, make, if a public person makes a report, it's not necessarily for you to just uh, sack the police, uh, uh, the police pers uh, person. Due process. Just, yes. So, so the whole point is, for all the good talk that you talk about in terms of what is being done, and how that perhaps uh, the decisions being taken at the top level of the police service is reflecting on the overall picture. How do you make sure as a service, those within the, the communities uh, who operate as your personnel also tend to uh, follow through with these reforms that you have commenced with? That is why I said a campaign is ongoing right from the national level through to the district sorry the regional and to the district okay. aside of that a police senior police officer can even be cited for lack of supervision so the senior police officer has a responsibility to ensure that those working under him mm. do not fall foul of the procedure or the laws governing the well, the legal framework so these are the things but at the end of the day you can we still have a few cases that may escape the police administration that is why we constantly remind the public to bring those things to the notice of the administration and it will be dealt with expeditiously well thank you very much and uh, dsp freeman tete uh, good talker i tell you uh he is um the pr head for
the Ghana Police Service Accra Region and thanks for speaking to us. Now, <laughs> I know you're a very good public relations person and a media person. You know, it's good to talk, but do you, as a parliamentarian and also the head of that very committee you're heading in Parliament, see the, the reflection of the stats of the reforms as, as by the police service within the way they work in the communities currently? Well, yes. Uh, the thing is, um, I'm, I, I, I see a difference in, in policing in Ghana. Um, over the years, as I said, I've been around a long time, so I, I know uh, what the police, where the police came from. Um, I happen to have done a film on, on the military and the police um, in my younger days, and so I know how they started off and all that. Um, we're not there yet. Um, I believe that it is the, we need to bring a certain element which is very, very important um, in, in, in the, the running and operations of the police, that we should strengthen the middle management of the police. Um, that means that in the old days they had sergeant majors going around to ensure um, that um, the, uh, the police were observing whatever um, uh, orders that they, they had to. And for example, um, the community policing scheme, which is which a lot of people have, 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 have lauded, um, where there's an increased police presence, let's say in the capital or in the major cities in the country. Um, you find the policemen all around and, and fine, it's a deterrent. But I, th I, I think that there should be an element uh, where the policemen should be sharp. Uh, and that can only be done um, if the middle management is very strong, where they have a roving inspector or a roving officer to see that the policemen are not reading papers, are not making phone calls, are not eating in the cars, and, and, and all that. I mean, just giving you an example of what, what, what concerns me, that they should be ready to move. I mean, when you're driving in a car, you'll see a police car passing by when there's, a, a, there's traffic, um, uh, you know, and they'll pass by without stopping. I mean, you know that in Europe, uh, policemen are always ready um, to work for the public. It's very important. However busy they are, if they realize that there's a situation that is going to put the public ill at ease, they'll get in and rectify the situation. We have to get there and we have to do that um, and I think that uh, we will be calling the senior officers to talk about strengthening the middle management. One of the reasons why the army is effective in doing it, it has the, 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 the non-commissioned officers are very, very, very powerful group of people and that should happen too in the, in the, in the police, um, whereby um, they make sure that uh, orders are, you know, uh, the desk sergeant and the sergeant in the police in Britain, very, very powerful. Um, they make sure that the other ranks are doing their, their, their work and everything. And that it's is only they fall in line. They, they fall in line and they make sure that the, the operations go smoothly inspectors and the commissioned officers and everything um, are there to ensure the monitor evaluate and ensure policies are adhered to and things like that we're getting there because we're getting a very very professionalized police force now what I also want to appeal um, as a member parliamentarian is that when recruitment um, starts um, most parliamentarians and senior government officials and senior people in this country are, are, are Policy, besieged. Senior policy. Yeah, are besieged. I mean, by people wanting, because of the fact that, you know, we have high unemployment, by people wanting their children and their wards and, and whoever to join the police force. And three quarters of the people who come, or the names of the people you bring to us, are not even qualified. So we tell them to observe and go through the, the proper process, recruitment process. If you feel you're good enough, go through the recruitment process because there are health considerations, there are physical considerations, you know, there are other considerations, there are educational qualifications because we, we want a certain type of person as a policeman. We want a, a person who is confident in himself, who is happy to be working in that institution. All those things come into the world for the well-being of the police which also then works as towards the well-being of the citizenry. Mm. Uh, how do you interact um, with the top hierarchy um, of the police service as a, as a top international civil society agency? Well, uh, for us, what we do at the top level is to invite them to uh, round table conferences or round table discussions where we lay there uh, some of these issues for, for discussion. Um, Amnesty International, um, at the, in other countries, 
will actually go to training um, centers where police are actually trained to uh, contribute to um, police training. We at uh, Amnesty Ghana are offering our services. I've heard um, um, DSP Tete saying that they are improving upon their human rights uh, training uh, at the um, police training institutions. Amnesty International has the skill, has the people. We are willing to offer uh, that service free of charge if the police will invite us. But at, at the top level, um, roundtable discussions go on between Amnesty International and the police. Mm. Uh, and currently, would you say that based on the reforms that are that have been taken by the police service, we will get to a stage where we will have minimal numbers being recorded in this because it, 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 it's, it's more of a, a human contact situation. Yes. Well, I, I will say that a lot of reforms are going on and, and we, we want to say that uh, I equal to the police because that is a contribution to improve the situation. But there are other issues that we have to handle, particularly from the public point of view, we have to also to educate the public as also what to do and what not to do. Because the public also have rights, but they also have responsibilities. They know what to do when the police take an action that is not appropriate. We should not just say uh, the police will not do anything about it, nobody will do anything about it, so I will not report it. We should also take action uh, as individuals, as Ghanaians. We made a point earlier on, uh, Mr. Bafo, about how the psyche of the citizenry is in a certain order or perspective. How do we make sure also the public is also brought in line to cooperate adequately with the police? Uh, oh, that is where I, I think that the NCC comes in. Um, I think that um, government should endeavor um, to resource that organization um, for them to raise the awareness um, um, of the people's rights and responsibilities. Um, as a as a as a, a Ghanaian above the age of 60, when I look at the, the generation and the, the present generation, the young generation, and the, the, there's a, a high degree of indiscipline, a high degree of irresponsibility. Uh, when you see how people ride motorbikes in town, how people break uh, traffic laws, how people do things that they shouldn't be doing, um, it's basically because we've got a burgeoning population. We've also got an increase in urbanisation in this country, and therefore it's very very hard to monitor and all that kind of thing. But people should realize that they belong to a community and it is in observing the rules and regulations of that community that the community can progress. Um, and that it's not about, though the individual is very important, all right, the sum of the whole is the community and that is how we do our things in Ghana. So therefore the organizations and institutions, um, both gov government and non-governmental -government institutions that are responsible or ha have the aim and objective of raising the awareness of people should either be resourced or should be more active, pro proactive in ensuring that people are, aware, get, are not only aware of their rights but also their responsibilities to their society. I think that's what very, is very important. Mm. And uh, in this report you mentioned not only the police service. No, we, we, we mentioned generally um, um, other institutions like the, um, the prison service. Um, as a DSP has said, we did not focus on Ghana, but um, other countries. But the Ghan uh, prison service was one of the um, institutions we, we look at. And uh, we are very aware what happens in, in our um, prisons and detention areas. Um, it is not deliberate, particularly in Ghana, to violate people's rights in the, in the prisons. But when you go to Ghana prisons, the congestion, about 40 people in a small room like this, well packed, and uh, no health facilities to, to, to quickly respond to when people are sick. And, and the food that we give to prisoners is nothing to write about. All these things are, even though are not deliberate to punish people, are referred to as torture. So yes, we did not uh, refer to only the police, but we look at um, such institutions at the, at the prison as well. Well, the Ghana Prison Service is also undergoing a rapid transformation. Um, we've built a new prison in Angafo, um, which has helped decongest um, some of the prisons of the country. But um, again, the historical precedence is there. I mean, <laughs> we started housing our, our, our prisoners in the, the former slave castles and forts. 
uh, most of them have been decommissioned now. We need to build more prisons and we need to take into consideration the objectives of the prison service. Is it a punitive organization? Is it a reformative organization? We know that it has to be a protective organization. In actual fact, in Britain, you have the Broadmoor Prison, which is a prison for the criminally insane. There are some people who are, psychi psychi they are they're psychologically unstable and are a danger to themselves and the public. You have to protect, protect them, so you put them into protective custody. But yes, people are punished by being taken away from the society. But in punishing them, you also have to reform them so that when they come out of prison, they come out as better people. But what we're having is that because of the circumstances of the, pl the prisons, we're getting people we call recidivists, people who go back to crime or even improve on their criminal, uh, uh, what do you call it, knowledge in prison. That is what we've got to work on. So we've got to ensure that we build better prisons and we have better conditions for our prisoners. It's very, very important because they also have rights. Even someone on death row has rights. So we have to be very, very careful about how we do this thing. And we have to invest more into uh, our prison uh, service. But they are also reforming. Their outlook is different. Uh, their outlook is not about keeping people in, and, and keeping them in, 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 in human um, situations. Yeah. Uh, in, fact, in fact, we, we do not, we have to even look at the total justice system in Ghana because our, uh, as of now, when, when a, an issue goes to the courts, the sentence is always custodian. We have to be looking at other alternatives so that we don't keep pushing people into, into prison. If we cannot bail, then we should find a way of um, having other alternative uh, punishment or reform. So the, the as prison as system as also forms part of the whole concept of the torture as per the study that you undertook. Now, go, go, going, going by what we have described here the last couple of minutes, um, how influential could be the issue of perhaps um, the non-availability of um, equipment, facilities, or logistics just in the right term of, of using it um, for fighting crime, and low morale or perhaps uh, inadequate emoluments to personnel across the, the, the divide, whether it's um, for the police or for the prisons or for the other security agencies, contributing to the current I issue we're talking about? Well, I think that we, we have to have a, a general look at that whole aspect of mm. our security systems in the country because of where they came from. Um, the thing is, um, in terms of the police equipment, training, in fact, all the security services, equipment and training is very, very vital. And the new systems um, of operations are very vital. We should have a good crime lab. We should have, um, we should have good facilities, yeah. um, crowd control where we, we do not injure people. Um, we, we came from actual live bullets to rubber bullets, now rubber bullets to uh, water cannons, water cannons to, uh, what do you call it, uh, zappers and things like that, or, or tasers or what they call them. All these things and the, the, the proper usage of those tools of, of, of control, um, all those things have got to come in. And I think that I am not the one to talk about it because the police are the experts. They know how to train their people. They know the objectives. But uh, equipment is very vital. With the prison service, um, what are we doing? This is an agricultural nation. At a certain time, prisoners were farming, and the produce from the farms was used to feed the, 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 the prisoners. Um, we have to look at that again. Um, we have to look at, we have to look at um, uh, educating uh, prisoners. I, uh, the last time, I was very happy to hear that a prisoner had passed his O levels or whatever and was going to go to university yes, when he yes. came out. Very, very, very good. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we should do. Um, uh, vocational training for, for the prisoners, giving them their dignity back because some of these people come from s situations which, in which you know that, that crime is almost unavoidable. They are hungry, they are poverty, they, they, they can't see, and, and this is what we, are, we have to concern our, ourselves about. So it's actually a societal thing, but we can't take it all like that. We have to look at it from the point of view that we've got agencies that operate um, within a certain ambit and the prison service is one, the army is one. But let me also say something. Um, the Ghanaian security services, when they go abroad, they excel. 
I mean, our police, uh, when they go to uh, on UN peacekeeping they duties, excel. excel. Like in Ghana, they do yeah, excel. basically, basically because there they are given the right kind of more, uh, training, the right kind of support. Um, the, the, their, dig, their dig, uh, dignity is enhanced, so they perform. And we have to take that into consideration and try and look at how, why that is so, mm. and, 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 and use that to improve um, the ability of our police forces to do the right thing. Your take on the subject of if, if the right environment factors. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's very true uh, that um, all the institutions that we are talking about lack logistical supports. It is very important for us to support the prison service. It's important for us to continue to support the, the, the police service because of lack of some of these logistics. That is why some we see some of these kind of things. Um, the police does not have all the equipment necessary for them to uh, apprehend and then take care of um, people alleged to have committed crime. So that's why some of these things happen. And even when you go to our prison service, even the prison officers where they sleep, it's an issue that we have to be looking at. You mean the prisoners or the officers? The prison the, the officers, officers themselves. themselves. At the prisons? Yeah. Yes. Or in the, uh, we, uh, because they, because they, they have their own residence. So they are, yeah. yeah, I mean, okay. we have to look at even their total benefit, I mean, their condition of service. We have to be looking at all those things mm. to be able to ensure that they have the facilities and the motivation to be able to take care of people we, we entrust in the in, in the more developed societies, so to speak, um, even one incident that is brought to the attention of the public, there's outrage among the populace. We're not saying that there should be outrage or we should also be reflecting same mood, so to speak. How do we make sure that perhaps the standards, barring whatever difficulties that we're plagued with as a country and that also the security services are plagued with, w w we achieve perhaps the best perfection as we can? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, perfection, I can't see perfection being a possibility now, but I think it's, it's, it, um, it behoves us um, to, to, to work, work that way, both the, the, the civilian populace and, and the security services. Uh, I'm happy that uh, there's a lot of progress. Um, we've got a very far-sighted group of people mm -hmm. handling the police service right now, and I think that they're putting the things in the right place. It's the same thing with the prison service, with the army too. I mean, we're looking at a new generation of, of officers uh, and men um, who know that they have a responsibility to the society that they belong to first and foremost before they can do any other thing. Um, so it's important. And what he said is right. We really have to work on the establishment. Um, of our security services in, in terms of housing, in terms of facilities, in terms of benefits, because they, they sacrifice a lot. Once you become a policeman, you sacrifice a lot. You actually sacrifice family, you sacrifice friends because of the, the, the kind of job that you have. Um, so it's very, very important that we, we give them the right kind of support. And now, so why are you taking the report from here now? I, well, um, no? as I said uh, yesterday, we were actually launching our stop torture campaign which means that uh, we are just beginning two years of uh, campaign to um, educate more and then to share information that we have with public mm. and that is exactly what we'll be doing we will continue the campaign and we are calling upon uh, civil society including the media to join us and we are calling on the NCC in Ghana and we hope that, um, well, the government uh, representatives are here who continue to support NCC to be able to do the work that they, they've given to them. He's not an executive representative. Well, but he can take the issue. <laughs> <laughs> he can take the so issue we tend, to, parliament. we tend to misconstrue the, 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 the rules. He's sometimes. in parliament. <laughs> we the we rules, take the yeah. issue there. Okay. Uh, so uh, now, now, what can the society, what role can the society play now? Well, the thing is that we've got all these NGOs and we've got all these organizations, and I think that they should engage the public more and say the public should, you know, the thing is about participation. Citizen participation is very, very important in all aspects of, 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 of societal uh, um, uh, uh, objectives. So, therefore, we really have got to uh, get the public involved more. And if the police engages the public more, for example, um, as a parliamentarian, um, we can organize derbers in which 
uh, the people will meet the police in, uh, in very congenial circumstances and uh, ideas can be exchanged, reports can be made and then um, it can be put forward. Those things are, are things that we are trying to do now and we're going to push. A last word. You want to say something? Yes, uh, to the Ghanaian public that um, human rights are very important. They are, that's how we, that's the foundation of uh, human beings. Uh, we have to protect it in all, in all f uh, spheres. And for the torture issue, uh, Amnesty International alone cannot do it. All the um, civil society, media, even the government itself, will need to come in for us to ensure that torture is uh, something that we can talk about as past. Okay, so that's it for our discussion on torture. But let's not focus only on Ghana, because according to the report, torture practices in Sudan include the use of amputation as a punishment. In April 2013, just, just last year, three men had their right hands cut off. It's not Sharia state, though. After being found guilty of stealing cooking oil following a trial in which they did not have a defense lawyer. And prison conditions are extremely inhumane in many countries in Africa with severe overcrowding and chronic lack of sanitation. In Liberia, Amnesty International witnessed severe overcrowding, lack of running water, and very poor sanitation. Cells are so small that inmates have to take turns to sleep. The next question I would have loved to ask is whether the cells that is in Liberia are that different from those in Ghana. But I don't want to ask that question at all. Just a rhetoric. And that's where we bring a curtain on our discussions this morning. I've had in the studio Parliament Chairman for its Defence and Interior Committee and also the Member of Parliament for Ablikuma South here in the Greater Accra region of Ghana, Fritz Frederick Bafo. Frederick. Frederick. I'm not French. I'm not French. <laughs> right, not French. Mm. Okay. And um, Lawrence Amesu is a country director for Amnesty International. We've been speaking on the subject of torture following its um, public uh, display of its newest report on torture in Africa and other countries in the world. We say thank you gentlemen for passing through. Thank we you. We hope to much. have you again sometime in the studio. We'll have a very fruitful discussion again on this same platform. Uh, it's been a talk on AM Talk, live on the AM Show, which is also live on the Joy News channel of Multi TV. Do stay on, we have a lot more for you.